Good evening, everyone. Uh, it is a proud privilege for me to host yet another uh, important event for the IAGS, the Indian Association of Gastrointestinal Endoscopic Surgeons, it in, in its ongoing academic endeavor. We have two important uh, minimally invasive surgery masters sharing their thoughts for the day. Person we are going to have listened to them in live is none other than Professor Ajay Kriplani, sir. The second one is the conversation of uh, Professor Krishna Rao, sir, with Dr. Govind Raj, sharing his uh, thoughts about various aspects. So let me have the privilege of introducing Professor Ajay Kriplani, sir. Professor Ajay Kriplani, sir, is the director and head of the Department of Minimal Access, Bariatric and GA Surgery at Fortis Memorial Research Institutes, Gurgaon, India. Uh, this is a national board of uh, exam accredited center for uh, FNB. He uh, is a retired professor of surgery from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. And uh, the feather of the cap on him is the Government of India, award by the President of uh, India, Dr. B.C. Roy National Award, which was bestowed upon him in the year 2009 for his exemplary academic skills in GA surgery and minimal invasive surgery. In fact, he has contributed for more than three, four decades to the development of the science of minimally invasive surgery. And uh, I'm happy to share to the young ones. He is also the past president of the IAGS 2008 to 2010 and is currently the trustee of the Indian Association of Gastrointestinal Endosurgeons. To add to it, he served as governor representing India in the ELSA during the year 2016 and 17. He has been recipient of 31 awards, honors at various levels, national, international, medical, and in the leadership for his distinguished clinical work, teaching and research. And the most important highlight is, he is the first in India to perform laparoscopic adrenalectomy in the year 1993 and laparoscopic splenectomy. And in the year 2012, in North India, he was the first one to perform the laparoscopic Whipple's procedure and uh, to have a brief count of his number of demonstrations. He was invited faculty for more than 472 live demonstrations as of date, guest lectures, orations, keynote addresses in conferences in India and outside India, including US, China, and Rome. He has traveled across the globe. He has, to his personal credit, 25 original scientific publications and has contributed 22 invited chapters in various books. And he is the chief editor of two important textbooks. Number one is the mini atlas of laparoscopic surgery. And number two is the comprehensive laparoscopic surgery textbook. And he's been organizing chairman for 11 important national conferences and multiple workshops and courses. And he is instrumental in developing the surgical skills and has trained hundreds of surgeons in laparoscopic surgery from India and adjoining countries. His teaching channel is a very popular one for all the young surgeons and surgeons who are trying to get into newer laparoscopic surgery procedures. And as of date, it has 2,50,000 surgeons who have benefited of it. And more so, it is one of the most visited channel with more than 10,000 visits per month. He's been postgraduate examiner for many universities, has guided hundreds of postgraduate theses, and has also been contributed very importantly as PI for numerous research projects. And he is the member of the core committee for making national recommendation for laparoscopic surgery. And he is a teacher of laparoscopic surgery in Ethicon Endosurgery Institute since its inception. I'm sure reading his CV will take much longer time. This is a brief important uh, information what I could get uh, from Professor Kriplanisar's CV. I would now Warmly welcome, Professor Ajay Kriplani, sir, to this evening IGS Prime Time Edition, the Feather of the Cap <coughs> program of the Indian Association of Gastrointestinal Endoscopic Surgeons. All of us are eagerly waiting to you, sir, to hear your wisdom this evening. 
Over to you, Professor Kriplani, sir. Thank you, Dr. Kanaga Vail, for your, your generous introduction. And uh, it has been always a pleasure to be associated with IAGS. And IAGS has been our workplace for decades now. And, uh, you know, uh, since the laparoscopic surgery came to India by the first cases being done by Dr. Udwadia, all of us followed his spirit, his zeal. He was the torch bearer. He showed us the path. And under his guidance today, IAGS is one of the largest, uh, you know, laparoscopic surgeons body in the world with considerable influence in decision making and making recommendations. So when... So I bring you compliments from Fortis Memorial Research Institute, Gurgaon, where I'm working. And uh, when Dr. Kanagavel asked me to speak on a topic of my choice, then I decided to speak on uh, laparoscopic hiatus hernia surgery. Why there are... I believe that in 1991, when uh, in Belgium, the first laparoscopic multiplication was done, that was a landmark event in the evolution of laparoscopic surgery. Why? Because nissen fundoplication was the first reconstructive laparoscopic surgery. Before that, all the surgeries described were ablative. You go in, you remove an organ. This was the first reconstructive surgery in which the value of suturing was highlighted. I mean, before the laparoscopic nissen fundoplication, Suturing was really not much in vogue, was not much thought of in laparoscopic field. But nissen fundoplication brought to the fore the importance of suturing in laparoscopic surgery. And when people realized that uh, nissen fundoplication is possible by laparoscopy, there was a spurt of training, enthusiasm, and zeal in learning suturing in laparoscopy. And a lot of endo trainers and a lot of time was devoted by people in learning suturing, which again, you know, which which opened up the pathway to advanced laparoscopic surgery. So laparoscopic missile fundoplication has been of tremendous importance in the evolution of the laparoscopic surgery. And missile uh, fundoplication shows that laparoscopic exposure is in fact better than open surgery. Earlier, before uh, missile fundoplication, we always used to think, does laparoscopy give equal exposure as open surgery? And the re response was doubtful. But nissen fundoplication showed that in deeper, more inaccessible area, laparoscopic provides better exposure, better color, better view, better anatomical relationship. Wherever you take the telescope, the light follows you, and the entire team can see. In open surgery, doing nissen fundoplication and pelvic surgery was extremely difficult, and this showed that laparoscopic surgery improves exposure in more difficult situation as compared to open surgery. Outfall of this was that laparoscopic nissen fundoplication helped the laparoscopic surgeon to regain the field that was lost to physicians. When cimetidine, when the nissen fundoplication came at that time, cimetidine and remetidine were, were extensively in use and TPIs were just making their entrance into the pharmacological industry. And hiatus hernia disease had become a disease of the physicians. Neither the surgeons were willing to do it in the open surgery because required a lot of traction, a lot of mobility, not the patients who are willing it. So once laparoscopic nissen fundoplication started, we regained this lost feat of hiatus hernia surgery from the physician. And again, this reflux in hiatus hernia became a surgical disease. And also, it's a perfect anatomical surgery. It demonstrates the value of the knowledge of anatomy of the surgeon, not only anatomy of the normal, but the pathological anatomy at what happens when a small hiatus hernia and a large hiatus hernia and a paraesophageal hernia and a short esophagus. So it's a completely, the, the value of knowing anatomy to that particular field in a very limited area was highlighted by this procedure. And also this is a very common condition. So you see these refluxes more often in your field. You can benefit more patients. And this procedure does not require any prosthesis unlike a laparoscopic hernia repair which increases the cost, doesn't require much infrastructure except the basic laparoscopic instrument. So that is why I chose to speak on laparoscopic, this is fundoplication and hiatus surgery as in compared to any other surgeons. 
But what we must understand is that case selection is very important in laparoscopic hydrocenia and reflux surgery. And it gives excellent results if you have chosen the patient properly. But to do that, you need proper training. And remember that first chance is the best chance. You mess up a hernia, you can go back and still repair it. You mess up a laparoscopic misinfundoplication, you are going to make the life of the patient really extremely difficult and the resurgery extremely complicated and with high chances of complication. So remember, so this is the importance of laparoscopic misinfundoplication and hernia repair. And I thought that I'll be sharing my experience and my perspectives over the years that the field has come. Now, I'd like to clarify that GRD and sliding hydrous hernia are not the same things. All sliding hernias do not have GERD. So you can have a hydrous hernia without GRD and a sliding hydrous hernia without GRD perhaps does not require any treatment. All GRDs do not have a hydrous hernia. So GRDs can exist independent of hydrous hernia and require treatment because GRD causes problems, not the hydrous hernia. But by and large, these terms are loosely used together because most severe GRDs have a sliding hernia. And the treatment is required for GRD to prevent complications and not for a sliding hydrous hernia. I'll not go into the basics of symptoms. You are all well learned surgeons and you are aware of it. But can be certain atypical symptoms like cough, global sensation, hoarseness, throat clearing, asthma, aspiration pneumonia, and pulmonary fibrosis, which can occur. And you have to identify that these asymmetrical symptoms are actually a manifestation by investigation other than simple endoscopy. Endoscopy remains the mainstay, and uh, we not only uh, see the ulcerations in the lower esophagus, we see the hydrous hernia and other abnormality, but in a patient of GRD, what we are looking for is a barrett esophagus. It's a Solomon pink mucosa in the lower esophagus, proximal to the anatomical GE junction. And this finding should ring alarms because this is a columnar line, lower esophagus. It is pre-malignant and the surveillance biopsy is very important. And if on surveillance you see high-grade dysplasia, then the risk of cancer is very high, 50% in three years. And therefore, it requires immediate intervention to prevent development of malignancy. Another very important investigation being more and more commonly used is 24 hour pH manometry. And this is the gold standard. You know, this should be preferably done in all patients suspected of GRD has an overall accuracy of 96% because there are many patients who have symptoms of reflux and on endoscopy you find that the lower esophageal mucosa is normal. There are no problems with the lower esophageal mucosa and these are the patients who do not have GERD. They are the patients who have NERD, non-erosive reflux disease and they have classical symptoms and you have to confirm the NERD and then operate upon them. But remember that even 24-hour pH study does not identify all patients of symptomatic reflux because there's a small 4 to 5 percent uh, group of patients who have non acid reflux. So you have gastroesophageal reflux, you have non esophagitis -esoph reflux disease, and you have non acid reflux. So, as a surgeon interested in treating patients with reflux disease, you should be able to identify these entities and treat them accordingly. If you are, uh, you know, doing a, a large hiatus hernia and we'll define what a large hernia, hiatus hernia is, then you may need a barium study and manometry can sometimes come as a very valuable tool. In some patients, it is extremely difficult to differentiate between reflux disease and achalasia. There are certain enthusiastic gastroenterologists who will refer you a very early achalasia cardia with the diagnosis of reflux disease. So you have to make your own evaluation because in the early echolasia, the endoscope can pass easily through the G junction. There is no obstruction. And if you do an uh, anti-reflux procedure in a patient with echolasia, it will be a disaster. So you have to know and manometry in such situations will come as a very handy tool to show the, the physiology of the lower esophageal sphincter. I'll not discuss about the medical treatment. You know that. You know, it's PPI and lifestyle changes. But 
despite all treatment, 25% of patients will have recurrent or progressive mucosal damage despite treatment. And some of them will be, as I said, bile reflux or acid. Now, patient selection is extremely important for the outcome. If you select patient properly, your outcome is going to be excellent. If you choose typical symptoms of reflux with esophagitis on endoscopy, you are going to have good results. But any doubt, you do a 24-hour pH manometry, which is more sensitive. And it is must when there is no esophagitis and whenever you are suspecting atypical symptoms because of gastrointestinal reflux disease. In the late uh, 20th century or at the end of the 20th century, there was a very popular approach of tailoring the anti-reflux procedure according to the findings of the radiology and uh, on, the, on the physiological studies of the lower esophagus. People used to preserve less or 360 degree wrap in a, uh, in a was standard, but you know, the partial fundoplication, the topid fundoplication was also used in those patients who had impaired peristalsis on the radiological studies. This approach went on for very long till in 1999, Horvath showed that partial uh, fundoplication, 270 degree fundoplication is very poor in controlling reflux disease and 46% of patients will continue to have symptoms of reflux after partial fundoplication or 270 degree fundoplication and this was again confirmed and now it is standard that all patients with reflux disease should preferably have a nascent fundoplication and not a 270 degree pupit fundoplication. The principles of laparoscopic nascent fundoplication are one, return the G junction into the abdominal cavity. Five centimeters of esophagus below the diaphragm. This is the most important step. If you just think that you can force esophagus into the abdomen by sutures, then you are you are not understanding the physiology of the procedure. There has to be an intra-abdominal five centimeter esophagus to create a good lower esophageal sphincter. And then you close the hiatal defect, which is invariably wide, and do a short floppy wrap so that you are strengthening the lower esophageal sphincter. If you adhere to these principles, you are going to have excellent outcomes. And we will see a video as to how we do a, a, a not very large hydrocenia or a reflux disease. We always approach to the, to the gastrohepatic ligament, identify the right crust of the diaphragm. The incision between the right crust and the esophagus is by energy. And then you go anteriorly and you see this cobweb. This is the classical plane in which you should be working. There's no vascularity here. It is completely avascular, opens up very easily. And you can see the right lung through the right pleura. Right lung pleura is quite a close relationship to the esophagus when you go higher up. So after you identify this, you go downward and see the right crust and identify the junction of the right crust to the left crust by creating a retroesophageal window. So this retroesophageal window will lift up this uh, esophagus and then you clear the rest of the left crust by mobilizing the fundus from the left crust. So with this maneuver, you can see in a vagus nerve here, don't dissect on the esophagus, dissect on the crust and you will safeguard the vagus nerve. So you create a retroesophageal window, a window in front of the left crust. This window is in front of the left crust and not the right crust. And then you keep enlarging this window by posterior dissection of the esophagus, separating it from the left crust and the aorta. So once that is done, then you come and start dividing the gastrosplenic ligament outside the gastroploic arcade. When you open the lesser sac, pancreas is visible. Go dividing the short gastric vessels carefully till you land up again at the left crust, which you have already dissected uh, in the previous dissection. And you can see how with each stroke, the esophagus gets mobilized and come downwards and becomes longer and longer intra-abdominally. So you have dissected the right side. Now you dissect the left side. The esophagus is separated from the left crust. And the left pleura always is closer to the esophagus than the right pleura. You see the, the lung with the pleura, the covered with the pleura. So this is a more closer relationship on the left side as compared to the right side. And you can see the line of the pleura and the lung and the pleura is intact. So you have dissected the right before. The left side is dissected after the short gastrics. And once you have dissected the sides, then 
and only then you dissect anteriorly between the pericardium and the esophagus. So the esophagus is circumferentially mobilized. Confirm that your vagus has not been harmed. Make sure that you have not damaged the crural fibers. You have kept the crural fibers intact. That is the inferior cava here next to the right crust. And then we use an intracorporeal slip knot or what you call as a cinch knot. This is a wonderful knot. The advantage is you can never over tighten this knot. You can never cause fibrosis. Crura is, is muscle. And if you tighten the, uh, the knot too much, you will convert this muscle into fibrosis. And remember that crura has an important role in respiration in the, of the diaphragm. So an intracorporeal slip knot will prevent any undue tightening and subsequent fibrosis of the crural fibers. Leave space in the hiatus equal to the size of the esophagus. If you have to put more sutures, little, little more anteriorly, if you put too many sutures posteriorly, you will cause angulation of the esophagus and this will lead to dysphagia. So make sure that you have closed the hiatus. So first app is mobilization. Second is hydroplasty and now the wrap. The highest point of the fundus should be taken to the right of the esophagus and do a, a shoe shine sign. And these sutures, the first suture should not take the esophagus. It should be the outer surface of the fundus on the left side and outer surface of the fundus on the right side so that you create a large volume wrap. So after you have done the first suture, demonstrate it's a floppy wrap by putting an instrument between the wrap and the esophagus. Then and only then you take a second and a third bite in which you take the esophagus to prevent subsequent slippage of the wrap. So the second and the third suture will take esophagus in the bite and you can see now how bulky, how large, large volume wrap is formed. If the wrap is large in volume, it will not migrate through the hiatus. If you are in doubt, put another suture and complete the procedure so that the, the wrap does not migrate. And that will conclude the laparoscopic, the standard laparoscopic mission fundoplication. The points to reiterate are esophagus is mobilized by dissection of the crura and not by dissection of the esophagus. Preserve the fascia over the crura. The key is mediastinal dissection and preserve both vagi. Free the fundus absolutely posteriorly and laterally so that when you take it to the right behind the esophagus, it should stay on the right. Remember, it is a fundic wrap and not a gastric wrap. So take the highest point of the fundus uh, for the wrap and you demonstrate that by doing a shoe shine sign. A floppy wrap, two centimeters long, three sutures, one centimeter apart each other, and the second and third sutures take the esophagus to prevent slipping. That is a standard laparoscopic and fundoplication. Parasophageal hernias we see quite often because we are a referral center. It is a true sac, often with a sliding component. So type three is what is more common. Symptoms are more vague and because of pressure on the lung or pressure on the mediastinum. Sometimes patients have vomiting when there's a gastric outer obstruction. Upper GI endoscopy is inconclusive. Uh, on a plain x-ray, if you see a gas bubble behind the heart, then that will confirm that the patient has a, a, a paraesophageal hernia. You see the bubble here. And on a barium, there can generally be a volvulus. It can be organoaxial or it can be along the axis. You can see different kinds of volvulus in the patients. Uh, if paraesophageal hernia, and now we should discuss what is called as a large hiatus hernia. So there's no general de uniform definition, but generally a large hiatus hernia is what is more than five centimeter wide or others say more than 30% or 50% of the stomach is lying in the chest. It is more often a type three hernia and a variable uh, percentage in different series is have large hiatus hernias. Now this is a typical large hiatus hernia, the left crust, which has gone very far uh, from the esophagus and the stomach has migrated. In the preoperative evaluation, upper GI barium series is helpful. CT scan can be done, but not very helpful if you've done a barium study. A pH monitoring, manometry, emptying studies are absolutely unreliable because the symptoms of reflux in these patients are masked and will appear only after the parasophageal hernia is repaired. So these are CT pictures of a parasophageal hernia, lying, uh, stomach lying in the mediastinum. Of in, in different sizes. And there's another word, short esophagus. This word is often coined with 
large hiatus hernia. And it is said that 15% of type 3 hiatus hernia have a short esophagus. Short esophagus is defined as inability to achieve 2.5 centimeters of intra-abdominal esophagus after a complete intraoperative mobilization, which means that short esophagus is an intraoperative diagnosis. You never label short esophagus preoperatively, and it is mostly because of the longitudinal scarring of the uh, along the esophagus and it may have associated stricture of the esophagus so that is a picture of a, a short esophagus where the g junction is very far high up in the mediastinum preoperatively you can predict a short esophagus if the hernia is more than five centimeters is there a stricture and if there's severe esophagitis and dysmotility of the esophagus it is important to be aware of this entity and to be prepared for this entity because if you are not prepared to handle a short esophagus intraoperatively, so you must think when you see the x-ray, can this patient have short esophagus? The confirmation will occur at the surgery. But unless you are prepared for this, you will find yourself in a very difficult situation to attain to treat this patient effectively. So the option for short esophagus are either to convert it to open surgery or to do various types of gastroplasties by open procedure, by thoracoscopic procedure, by laparoscopic procedure. But I think, again, the key is extensive mediastinal mobilization to achieve a longer length of esophagus within the abdomen and bringing it downwards from the chest. The surgery for parasitic hernia is more complex and demanding. The, some people only reduce the hernia, some do gastropaxy, thinking it will be effective. Some people do gastrostomy but they have significant morbidity and the best procedure remains a reduction and anti-reflux surgery. The, how it differs it from a sliding hernia, there's a true sac and the sac must be excised by extensive mediastinal and crural dissection. Unless you excise the sac, you will not be able to bring the esophagus into the abdomen. And remember that anatomy is very distorted because the esophagus and G-junction form the posterior wall of the sac. And if you are not careful in excising the sac, injury can happen. And in these patients, preferably 4 centimeters and minimum 2.5 centimeters of the esophagus should be brought to the abdominal cavity. So there is a large, large uh, hiatus hernia. It's a parasophageal hernia. Basically, they are a continuum. A large portion of stomach is lying within the mediastinum you can see the sac you start from the gastrohepatic omentum divide and go right up to right in the right crust and then the first thing is invert the sac and dissect the sac out of the mediastinum don't go and do the usual procedures that you do in a sliding hiatus hernia parasitial hernia is a different entity you have to dissect close to the sac because the sac structures lie close to the lungs on both sides and the heart and we will see how far we go. So this is the right crust. This is the left crust. This is the sac. And we are pulling more and more sac and dissecting more and more sac out of the mediastinum in a bloodless fashion. So that is the esophagus. You can see the right border, the left border. You can see cardiac pulsations here. You can see the cardiac pulsations here. They're very close. So you're dissecting the sac from the right crust now because the sac is densely applied to both the crura. So you dissect the sac from the right crust. And remember that this crust is sac is going very high. The pleura is right there. So you have to you have to be careful not to make opening in the pleura because it by both sides opening can happen in a large parasophageal hernia. So we are we are dissecting with the right border is because it is lung covered by the pleura on the right side. You can see the extent of dissection on the right side. So we dissect on the right side. Then we dissect the esophagus from the left crust here, and then we dissect anteriorly. Anteriorly, we have to go very far and wide into the mediastinum. You have to go as long as the inferior pulmonary vein pulsations. You can see the pericardial cardiac pulsations here, the right lung covered with a pleura. So you can see the extent of mediastinal dissection is much more, much wider. And this is the inferior pulmonary vein. So after you've done an extensive mediastinal dissection, then you come down, divide the short gastric vessel so that you go to the same left crust which you have already dissected, preserving the fascia over the left crust because otherwise 
the sutures will cut through to the fleshy crust and now the posterior dissection the esophagus is entirely here see the size of the size of the crust here so again dissecting between the aorta and the esophagus again very widely you have to go very high up in the mediastinum you can see that's the aorta and this is the tissue that we are we are separating from the aorta a lot of adhesions happen in this area and sometimes and this is the sac so after complete dissection the sac is excised otherwise when you take sutures for the uh, for the crew for the wrap uh, you will find it difficult so this is the completed dissection and then we are suturing the crura be careful that you do not make too much posterior repair otherwise the esophagus will be angulated and the patient will have dysphagia so two or three sutures here make sure you there is no tension on the crural sutures if you have dissected them sufficiently generally there is not but it is the time to judge whether you are going to do a primary crural repair or you are going to need a prosthesis so this is the time when you decide that and after putting three sutures then we close the defect anteriorly also because only posterior closure will cause a lot of angulation of the esophagus and this again demonstrating you the uh, the shoe shine sign the stomach lying freely to the to the right of the esophagus and i'll not show you the sutures here because we have already seen them so second and third sutures take going through the esophagus and that is the completed wrap so hiatal closure versus suture closure versus mesh closure sutures are generally sufficient you should do non absorbable suture either polyester or proline but don't use silk silk fragments so it should not be used in hydroplasty avoid tension and mesh is used very selectively if the defect is large and if you feel that there's a tension there can be different ways of placing your mesh you can uh, uh, you can also use sutures with the crura attenuated or if the patient has cuff pre operatively hydral uh, the mesh that you use is either a pptfe or a bio mesh some people have used proline but i will never use it because there's a risk of erosion there's no serous on the esophagus and this is a mobile part the esophagus keeps on moving with each peristalsis so proline mesh is more likely to cause erosion uh, you can do a closure with an only mesh or you can give a relaxing incision on the right crest and then bridge the uh, and then put a only mesh or you can bridge the defect if the hiatus is very large and though some studies suggest that a large hiatus mesh may decrease recurrence but so many multiple variables make comparison difficult and results meaningless now this kind of hiatus hernia we are seeing more and more frequently now the diaphragm and the sleeved stomach having migrated into the mediastinum patients are generally grossly symptomatic their life is a hell and once you diagnose a hiatus hernia you must treat this hiatus hernia and nobody knows what is the best possible surgical treatment for this kind of hiatus hernia because you have already lost the fundus you cannot do a fundoplication you can only cause reduction of the esophagus into the abdomen and cause a, and and do a hydroplasty the mobilization should be absolute it is thorough and very loose some people have used so many types of wraps around it the round ligament wrap the omental wrap but none of them to be superior to the other we in these patients generally do a hydroplasty along with reduction of the hernia you can see the previous adhesions again i have taken the patient with a minimum adhesions generally adhesions are much more than what you see here so you to, the difficulty is in identifying the the esophagus so again you identify the the stomach going through the right crust lot of adhesions will need division to clarify the anatomy and to identify the stomach which is migrated through the hiatus so this is the dissection around the hiatus to identify the stomach this is the left crest of the diaphragm you can see the of the the perigastric fat having migrated into the mediastinum so try to gradually lyse adhesions reduce more and more stomach from the mediastinum into the abdominal cavity do it from the left side at the spleen here and then do it from the right side so as and when you start continuing the dissection and you know freeing the stomach from the mediastinal adhesions more and more stomach will be brought into the peritoneal cavity again a lot of adhesions of the Uh, omentum and fat that will require to be to free the stomach so that it can be brought down see the hiatus 
be careful you do not open the the pleura and be careful you do not open up the sleeve stomach here because that will be difficult to repair so you will start seeing the esophagus here now and the, the stomach is being brought into the peritoneal cavity so it's a difficult procedure it requires more skill it requires more expertise the patient should be explained that the chances of morbidity are higher the chances of hospital stay are higher a standard disinfundoplication can go home in 24 hours but these patients you have to be have more careful if you are not experienced enough take the help of a colleague take the help of a friend take the help of a senior and then you will be able to do a good job but all these sleeves uh, which have migrated to the mediastinum are highly symptomatic and they will not they will they will need uh, they will need reduction and they will you can see now the esophagus has started coming down into the peritoneal cavity more and more division of adhesions so identifying the, the structures here so you can see more and more you dissect more and more now you see the vagus you can see here vagus must be preserved at all costs and you can see the crura have been identified and suturing the hydras in the same way as we saw earlier so the standard is laparoscopic nissen fundoplication with a floppy nissen but remember that normal LES is dynamic it relaxes when the patient swallows when you create a LES with a wrap this is a over competent LES it is not a dynamic LES so you can't expect the patient's swallowing should be normal or the belching should be normal they should be explained to the patient and therefore never guarantee 100 percent of symptomatic relief in these patients because it's a it's a non-dynamic uh, LES this this is what it leads to gas bloat syndrome and dysphagia is a serious symptom if you are over tightening the hiatus and the resurgery is required in three to six percent of patients after an acid fundoplication so predictors of failure in laparoscopic anti-reflux surgery atypical symptom poor response to medical treatment post-operative vomiting bmi more than 35 and hiatus hernia of more than three centimeters in size symptoms of a lap resin fundoplication may be failure to relieve the pre-existing symptoms or new symptoms and proper patient selection and 24 hour PA study will help you improving your outcome these are the various causes of post-operative symptoms which will require repair or treatment if you can find an anatomical abnormality but a redo fundoplication is a very challenging task the indications are esophagitis on OGD of a fundoplication abnormal 24 hour PA study and evidence of anatomical failure correlating to the patient's symptoms you can have a double compartment syndrome if the wrap has slipped onto the body of the stomach but more common is disruption of the hiatal repair or a very tight wrap uh, which leads to dysphagia and this dysphagia is recalcitrant and is very difficult to treat without surgery and you have to treat it operatively you can see that this patient came to us with absolute narrowing at the hiatus you know hardly any barium was passing this was two years after he had an acid fundoplication somewhere else a delayed study showed a very small streak going into the stomach and that is when we operated him this is what we found uh, this is these are the additions between the stomach and the spleen and you can see this is the left crest of the diaphragm and the sutures here the stomach is sutured to the diaphragm there's no esophagus similarly the stomach is abutting to the hiatus there's no esophagus in the abdomen on endoscopy the obstruction was at the hiatus and also on the barium these are the aortic pulsations aorta is closer because the previous dissection has been done so carefully separating the stomach from the crust and uh, and uh, and is showing the esophagus you can see how tight the the hiatus is there's hardly any space around the esophagus for a food bolus to come so come doing an anterior dissection getting some length of the esophagus intraperitoneally that's the ivc next to the right crust and you can see multiple sutures here very tight crust so these suture sutures will need to be divided you need space equal to the size of the esophagus and the hiatus so that the patient can swallow the bolus and after you have released it and then then you see that the the wrap has to be dismantled you have to dismantle the wrap and do a fresh wrap you see the sutures here these are additions around the wrap once you divide the additions around the wrap this is the true wrap here now the esophagus can be made out so again 
dismantle the wrap completely don't rely on the previous wrap because the third surgery will be extremely difficult even after you dismantle the wrap completely you see the additions which causing distortion of the fundus of the stomach so these these additions have to be lysed so that the fundus again becomes as free as a normal fundus is and you can carry a good wrap this is the fundus which is coming to the right behind the esophagus is adherent to the posterior surface of the esophagus so it has to be freed this is the esophagus this is the fundus which is coming to the right it has to be carefully freed so that you neither damage the esophagus nor you damage the fundus and then you push it to the left and you try to retrieve the fundus but you see that the fundus is not retrieving so you see the pancreas adherent to the to the fundus posterior surface of the fundus here so you separate the pancreas from the fundus posterior aspect of the fundus by a combination of sharp and blunt dissection you can see how pancreas is adherent to the posterior surface of the fundus you can never predict what kind of anatomy you are going to find in a redo surgery so the pancreas is separated now you can see the pancreas is lying here and then we try to pass the buji but buji will stuck here it will not pass and there is extensive fibrosis in the lower esophagus so this fibrosis has to be separated from the esophageal muscle uh, uh, window is made and this fibrous tissue is excised so that the esophagus again becomes soft and pliable you can't use cautery here so close energy here so close to the esophagus so if we are using a sharp dissection but you see absolutely soft pliable esophageal musculature here and all this fibrous tissue is gone which was obstructing the passage of the buji and this is the fibrous tissue that has been separated from the lower esophagus again some addition of fundus posteriorly the vagus now the normal shaped hiatus now sutures have been divided a good retroesophageal window and you see that the buji is passing easily now and then once you know that you have opened up the hiatus and relieved the dysphagia in this patient he had a previous nissen fundoplication we decided we will do a topic uh, uh, fundoplication and not a nissen fundoplication a 270 degree wrap so on the right side of the esophagus suturing the gastric fundus to the esophagus three sutures on the right side so three sutures on the right side and then we will take three sutures on the left side so that the patient does not has a dysphagia remember post operative reflux is easier to treat but post operative dysphagia is extremely difficult to treat and if you have to choose between the two prefer to leave a little reflux than to cause little dysphagia so that is completion of a two pit uh, 270 degree posterior wrap so uh, 3 to 6% of patients will require resurgery which is very challenging should be undertaken by only surgeons very experienced in this field and the symptomatic relief will be good rated on 90% if you have a demonstrable anatomical abnormality which corresponds to the symptom so the challenges of previous surgery you have seen in the video i uh, i will not go into detail extensive fibrosis don't compromise vascularity complete take down the the wrap and avoid injury to the gastric fundus so to conclude chairman sir complications of the gr surgery are very difficult to treat first surgery is the best chance prevention is the best strategy resurgery is difficult outcome is less satisfactory and to conclude sliding hiatus hernia constitutes 90% of hiatus hernia lab repair is the gold standard technique is fairly standardized in skilled hand most approaches most uh, paraesophageal hernias can be repaired by minimal access surgery and the results of surgery are good and they sustain in the long term all this work was supported by my team at fortis memorial research institute gurgaon thank you very much thank you uh, professor kriplani sir uh, it was indeed a really <coughs> what to say the pleasure to watch in fact uh, when we see the instruments coming up in the right axis when we see it hiatus bang on the center when we see everything is dissected with utmost care it looks like uh, we should come to you to learn some more tricks so that our surgeries become more fine sir we would love to do sometime definitely with once this situation clears sir i have few questions from the participants sir i will request you to please unshare the screen sir so we can be seen well 
शेयर कैसे करते बेटा थैंक यू सर सर व्हाट इज द मोस्ट डिफिकल्ट स्टेप इन हाइटल खानिया सर्जरी अकॉर्डिंग टू यू and what is the most important difficulty the uh, new surgeon or young surgeon should be careful about according to you that's a very good uh, question karanga ved you know the most difficult dissection is the mediastinal dissection and the entire success of hydras hernia surgery depends on how thorough how good uh, mediastinal dissection you do unless you achieve 5 cm of intra abdominal esophagus you are not able to create a new areas and the people are very uh, you know apprehensive of going into the mediastinum because on the right side you have done at the pleura on the left side the pleura is more close and even if they dissect little bit on the right and little bit on the left side you have to do a 360 degree dissection which means you lift the esophagus from the para aortic tissues and the most difficult is anteriorly when you want to go anteriorly and you see cardiac pulsations so unless you have dissected the right the left and the posterior don't go into the anterior space because there is no space there the esophagus is quite closely in relationship with the pericardium so right side is the first to be dissected then you dissect the left side once you are mobilize the right and the left then you can lift the esophagus create a retrophysical window in front of the left crust and take it cranially between the esophagus and the aorta and then and only after then you retract the esophagus either with a rubber or you know with an instrument whatever your preference of choice is i do not use any any extra uh, you know uh, thing to retract my grasper does my assistant's grasper does the job and then you gently lift the pericardium with a curved instrument the tip going posterior a grosse will be fine it's a ideal instrument to lift the heart anteriorly and then you create a space and the anterior dissection is always to be a sharp or an energy dissection there is no space for a blunt dissection because in a blunt dissection when you are moving an instrument to break the tissue you need more space so anterior dissection retract the uh, the pericardium anteriorly and do a sharp dissection by pressing the esophagus posteriorly and if you have already done the the right the left and the posterior dissection and giving enough traction the esophagus will come down in a straight forward case it may not require more than 3 or 4 cm but in a large hernia a paraesophageal hernia in a short esophagus there have been occasions when we have gone above the tracheal bifurcation i mean the key to success in hydras hernia or reflux surgery is mediastinal dissection everybody can do a short gastric dissection everybody can do a, a right crust dissection the most difficult is the mediastinal dissection and the second most difficult is the left crust the fundus of the stomach is wrapped on the left crust so when you try to remove the fundus be very careful that you are not removing the fascia over the crust it is a very common mistake that in 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 an, in an effort to remain away from the fundus of the stomach you go into the muscle fibers and then you take off the fascia and then when you go and take the bites from the left crust for a hydroplasty then your fibers of the crust start fraying so these are the two most crucial points in a in a fundoplication very important lessons on uh, hydral surgery sir uh, uh, there is a another question sir with so many years of experience of hydral hernia surgery do you think uh, having a robotic access a robotic approach uh, gives more comfort to work into the hiatus you are opening your pandora's box <laughs> maybe briefly you can address because they can probably this is one of the person whom you have trained i guess the question is very very sharp to you uh, this is a very 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 big question a robot is a new addition to the surgeon's armamentarium every technology it's a technological advance and every technology has an appropriate value 
in an ideal situation there is no technology which is bad all the technology the surgeon has to learn to give better results to his patients and to improve the surgical outcome the question is are you using the technology only when it is required or are you abusing the availability of the technology in situations where the application of technology will not improve outcome the crux of the matter is improving outcome now there can be you know various opinions about it some people feel that by adopting the robotic technology they are improving the outcome in the patient and then they are justified there are some people who feel that perhaps even in the most difficult situations robotic technology does not improve outcome it definitely improves patient surgeon comfort and as i am growing old my knees have started aching perhaps i will be inclined to use robot the question is should i make my patient pay for my comfort it's more an ethical question it is more a moral question it is more a financial question than an academic question thank you sir it's been uh, you've been very honest and brutally honest i would say Uh, put the fact bang on the face of the question uh, question asking person sir one last question sir most of the questions are already covered because they were shooting the questions while we are talking and you have covered in subsequent slides one last questions i am not sure but you are going to have a very big talk in the forthcoming igs meeting when is a mesh indicated in hydral hernia surgery see mesh has a definite role in hydral hernia repair the more complicated uh, hernias you repair the more large hernias you repair the more uh, meshes you are going to require generally speaking in a hernia which is less than 5 cm wide hydras hernia generally you can get away without using a mesh but there are sometimes real situations where the pleura are completely attenuated you fear that if you put sutures the the crura will not hold the sutures when the dissection has been so difficult that you have actually damaged the crural fibers when the hydras hernia is so large that you feel that when you put sutures then there will be tension you know it's it's a very important if you see the pathological anatomy of the hydras hernia wherever the hydras hernia enlarges the right crust remains where it was it is always the left crust which gets more and more laterally shifted if both the crura were getting equally apart then perhaps you know there will be less tension on closer but because of the fact that the right crura remains where it was and the left crust goes more and more laterally in a patient with 6 cm uh, wide hiatus you might feel that the suture may cause tension which will subsequently cut through particularly if the patient has asthma and chronic cough and he coughs in the post operative period if you feel that the crural fibers are not holding well then there is definitely a role of mesh in mesh can be applied in various ways mesh if you feel that there is tension on the sutures then you can do just a, a bridging defect of the mesh or what is more commonly done is that you close the crura and then you put an only mesh a, 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 a only patch on that and a third thing which we have been doing recently more often is that you divide the diaphragm to the right of the right crust that is the thinnest portion there there is no important structure there so you divide the diaphragm to the right of the right crust this will swing the right crust towards the left crust you will be able to close this portion without tension and on this place where you divided the right crust the liver the left lobe of the liver is also coming so if you place a mesh widely over this repaired hiatus and this defect in the diaphragm suture it in place and subsequently let the left lobe of the liver come on this place and give further support then perhaps this will give better results and now more and more surgeons are adopting this technique the question remains which mesh you will use as i said earlier esophagus is no serosa and esophagus is a mobile organ you know with each swallowing the muscles are moving and if you keep a proline mesh in, in in close proximity the chances of erosion are higher so we either use a ptfe mesh 
or a biological mesh. But there are situations where mesh is definitely required and improves the service. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think uh, it's been a lot of learning for us. And I think heightal surgery is a day long discussion uh, science which need to be discussed. Now I hand over to Professor Raman Goyal to officially give the thanks to Professor Kriplani, sir. Uh, good evening, Dr. Kriplani. Uh, it's amazing to hear from you. Uh, you know, besides the surgical technique, which was a wonderful demonstration, uh, the physiology that you have discussed at various stages during your discussion was amazing. So I think uh, that is what people need to understand, how the crust moves when the defect happens, how you can uh, give an anatomical repair without using a mesh, uh, if you can manage that. So I think this is all. The entire talk will be available on the on YouTube channel of IAGS, and uh, uh, people can go and see and hear it again and again and uh, and uh, learn the steps. Uh, uh, you know, Dr. Kriplani uh, was the president when first time I got elected as executive committee member of IAGS, and it's it's a long time that. Uh, uh, the, and it's an honor to have him on the program as the and he's the, also the advisor of uh, IAGS, one of the senior most persons. So it had been a pleasure to host you today, sir. And uh, the next guest today, we are running a little behind. Thank you, President, that. sir. Can I just make one comment? Oh, sure, sure. In fact, honor has been mine that I've been invited to give this speech with, uh, during your presidency. And I must congratulate you that despite these difficult times, difficult COVID times, you have kept the torch of the IAGS, you know, burning very high. You can always, always see that despite, you know, so many restrictions and bans on holding conferences, the academic activity of the IAGS has not slowed down. And all of us are really very proud of you as a president. And we congratulate you for a wonderful work that you are doing. And we really enjoy, you know, contributing uh, our work during your presidency. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So friends, uh, I have two more announcements before we go and invite Dr. Uh, B.K. Rao. So uh, in each of these uh, IAGS Prime, we have one pioneer and one legend. So today we have Professor B.K. Rao, B. Krishna Rao as a legend. And he will be uh, interviewed by the Vice President of South Zone. Uh, and he will be talking to him about his life, about his contribution to the society. Uh, he, he has been uh, the uh, Dr. B. Krishna Rao had been the president of IAGS, president of ASI, a highly decorated surgeon. And on top of it, he has been one person whom everybody looked up to whenever there has been difficulty in societies. So one man who kept societies on even keel is Dr. B. Krishna Rao. So, so I'll be inviting him and he'll be interviewed by Dr. Govind Raj uh, very soon within a minute's time. I just wanted to show you uh, something that we have in store for you for next week. And uh, uh, we have got uh, a very senior surgeon. I'm sure all of you know him. He's almost the father of laparoscopic surgery who will be live with us uh, uh, a fortnight away on 27th for one hour. Uh, only Dr. Kosheri and to he is a friend of IAGS and he has been to our meetings in past. He has not been here for many, many years now. And he will be interviewed by none other than Professor Tempton Udwadia himself, who is a founder president of IAGS and a close friend of uh, Professor Kosheri. So please uh, Block your date, block your time. It will be one event which will be go in the history of IAGS and uh, which will you will remember uh, uh, when you will retire that you you have seen the Professor Kusheri being interviewed by Professor Udwadia. So with that, I I uh, leave it to Dr. Kanagvil to invite uh, Professor Krishna Rao and uh, Dr. Govind Raj to, to take charge. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Kriplani. Bye bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Kriplani, sir. Thank you, President Dr. Raman Goyal, sir. Uh, Nitin, can we have the video up, please?
beautiful evening to meet you on this occasion on the teachers day i am so much indebted to you for what all you have taught to most of us and to me particularly thank you and what i am today is because of you he has been my uncle's classmate senior to my father and he had started the art of endoscopy and laparoscopy innovated it in my hospital i just want him to say about how he became a surgeon and what was the main reason and who was his real mentor for becoming a surgeon sir thank you govindraj for your kind words first of all thank you for coming all the way from trichy on this covid era for this for this interview i was born in rajamandri now in andhra pradesh way back in 1939 but all my schooling and college was in chennai my father was a general practitioner hence there was a tendency to words medicine so apart from this uh, being a mentor and uh, your father being a doctor and uh, you had uh, done your studies both in india and in abroad correct so i want you to tell particularly the younger surgeons today what is the difference you felt in the teaching in india and abroad particularly in uk where you had done most of your studies and uh, what did you say about the importance of clinical education from uh, what you have learned my mentor dr akpanabra was very particular that i should go to uk to have a further training and in the meanwhile to get the fellowship degree as well the important uh, change when you go abroad at that time is that you see the surgery in a different aspect it is looked at as a craft and you are taught the way thing has to be done with a scientific background whereas in india it was i do like this so you also do like that without the questions being asked after our reading the textbooks the textbook says so the answer would be no this is how i do it you also do it in that same fashion whereas in england we found that the there was an explanation to the manner in which they taught us the second important thing was there was a grounding of proper recording of your case records and through that some scientific research on your work that you are doing one of the thing that i learned was that we have to teach the younger generation at that time the teaching to the next generation is only by you copy what i do it is not like what you should do what it should be done what is being done so that is not there at that time which we see that today in today's world to become a surgeon is not easy and apart from that to become a successful surgeon is going to be the most difficult thing i need you to say to all the young surgeons how to do the balancing act between your profession and your family and how do you do it and the tips you have to tell for the youngsters here as far as the family life is concerned you have to set apart some part of your time i used to take away on saturday evenings and sunday evenings i used to play tennis my children and my wife used to be in the club we used to watch there used to be 30 year old movie have dinner together and come home because one of one time my daughter told me papa you are coming like a butterfly and going away from the butterfly that's all they see me fluttering in and fluttering out that made me realize that i have to spend more time with the family being a part of the iags <laughs> i want you to tell your early days your acquaintances with uh, our founder president professor shemtan gurwadia how you met him and how the acquaintance started and the formation of the iags yes the formation of iags dr agarwal was the first secretary of the iags 
we were about 40 who were doing laparoscopic surgery who came together and formed the society. Tempton, I knew him when he was a president of the ASI. And I was part of the ASI at that time. And the uh, association with him, he was a gentleman to the core. And he had high principles, which he does exponent all the times and tells the youngsters, you have done a good job. Or he will tell you, why don't you do it like this? It may be a better way. He doesn't say you did a wrong thing, but he would correct the younger generation as what is to be done. Again, he will not take any credit for what he has done. He will always say it is because of luck, it was of came in my way. And then I found him going up the ladder of the surgery, not only nationally, but internationally. But in spite of it, he was the same perfect gentleman, still remembering even till last week when he talked to me, finding out how we were managing with the COVID, give my love to the girls at home. So that personal touch has been there. Of course, that became more closer as we were in the IAGS. We were meeting more often and exchanging ideas. And he was the one who shared my view that endoscopy should also form part of laparoscopic surgery. And that, in the last few years, has come true. And uh, you have been a part of the various organizations, both nationally and internationally. And uh, you have held the post of uh, the president of uh, ASI, IAGS, uh, World Laser Association, and it goes on. And having been in those highest position of various associations, I want you to tell the youngsters what they should do to become a member of these associations. Apart from that, what does this membership mean to them? And how can they extract the real value out of these associations to their well-being? At the time, uh, I had more energy, but not of time. I used to be a part of about seven associations in which I ascended the ladder of various positions to occupy the position of the president, seven in uh, nationally and three internationally. Uh, my point is that when you are a part of an association, one, you learn what is that association's aims and goals are. How much do you fit into that association? and how much you can contribute to the association's well-being and also to its enhancement to the members. By attending the annual conferences of these different associations, you come in touch with doctors who are in that particular field of surgery. Also, international visitors who come to those associations. So you get to know them by name, by face, and interact with them at that time by post. There was nothing like emails and uh, WhatsApp. So we used to write letters and we keep in touch. You get invited to attend the conferences of the similar nature in other parts of the world. And when you go there, you will see their method of approach to the subject, what they are doing at that period, what you can learn the latest that they are doing in that particular field, like endoscopy, laparoscopy, or lasers, and come and apply the same back in India as much as you can. Secondly, once the uh, people outside the India realize that you are doing some good work and is worthy of presentation, they invite you to come and share your knowledge with them. And uh, you have been the first person to be awarded the honorary fellowship from American Surgical Association. And I think uh, that's the first time this kind of an award has been given for an Indian. First Indian, first to, Indian receive to receive, receive it 10 years ago. And first I should congratulate you and I should ask you on your opinion, how do you look at these awards? Sir? And the second one is the most important coveted award for a teacher you get in the medical field is a B0 award. And that, I think, you will receive it three decades before. 
and of course you are an honorary professor and uh, honorary fellow of the royal college of thailand also and apart from the regular royal colleges uh, i don't think you have any other royal college uh, left behind sir so for the surgeons younger surgeons uh, just tell us how you look at these awards and how do you rate them and uh, what it means to you exactly first of all you don't work for an award today people work for uh, to obtain an award the for me it was i do my work i exhibit my work i allow others to evaluate my work and then allow them to see whether i am fit to be given the award i mean that should be the way it should go i have not gone in person to receive it, to uh, obtain these awards except by my hard work i went to thailand for nearly 10 years every year for the postgraduate course to teach the poor boys not only endoscopy laparoscopy and laser at at the end of the period of time they said thank you for coming and then they honored me by providing me with the honorary fcs as far as the american association is concerned they we had the hepatobiliary congress in chennai at that time number of people had come from all over the world and they found the amount of work that was presented here and what was exhibited was of high class international standard that was when that the american association felt that i deserve to be an honorary member and i became the first indian to be the honorary member of the american surgical association which i got only a few hundreds out of all the surgeons in the world as their members you have enjoyed your surgery and endoscopy and laparoscopy and i would like you to say which is the most enjoyable procedure in laparoscopy which you do and in the endoscopy same way which you enjoy the most and why see the one that we started the gallbladder cholecystectomy is still my favorite surgery one because it is not difficult but the dissection the delineation of the duct and the artery the common bile duct is a pleasure not only to for yourself but to demonstrate to the others how it should be done and how we should avoid complications in endoscopy the hepatobiliary uh, biliary tract is the most interesting thing to do because you remove the stones in the common bile duct without surgery i vividly remember in the early 90s when i completed my medicine i came to see you with my uncle uh, it was the wellington hospital and uh, there was a live workshop that was one of the first workshops in south india for laparoscopic colostomy and i used to wonder at the time if i'm right you are 50 plus at the time and uh, that was a time when most of the surgeons who practiced open surgery didn't want to take up laparoscopic surgery and that was the time people are saying laparoscopy is not good open is always better and now the time has come to say that laparoscopic cholecystectomy has become gold standard so you have to tell the youngsters age is not a criteria if you have to change what is the reason and what is the perseverance that really forced you to change from open surgery and to laparoscopic cholecystectomy and laparoscopic surgeries See, the first time I saw the laparoscopic cholecystectomy was in the ACS in states. The video was so compelling. I said, "Is that going to be that easy to remove a gallbladder with two or four small punctures?" So that is a so what shall I say? A stress or a challenge to learn the technique and do it. So I learned the technique, came back. and started the work here uh, and that became a procedure which i thought i should demonstrate to others so that they will feel that this is not a difficult procedure i think age is not a factor in learning even today you still learn in methodology of surgery 
you may not practice it, but you know the methodology, how things are going and how you have to change. So I was young in mind, but maybe I'm 50 in age, but my functions were well within my control and I decided to take it up. Whatever you think the quality of the surgeon should be from the patient point. See, the patients are today are told in a most dramatic way. You should have been operated yesterday. Second, oh my God, you are taking this. How are you alive? So they are really at a quandary to know where they stand. The best approach is to be honest with them. Tell them that you have this particular problem. And as the information that we have by the investigations done by you, this has to be operated. This, if you do not operate, what will happen if you keep it within your body? You can also tell him that you have an alternative method of approaching this problem. As I told you, CBD stones, we can tell them surgery was the gold standard before, but today with ERCP, we are removing with the basket. You have got that choice. I think a person has to be honest to the patient and tell him, look, you have a problem. You require the uh, uh, rectification. These are your options. Where do you want to have it done? Do you want to have it done here? Do you want to go to a center that does it more often? I had to send once a patient to uh, Nagiredi. He was able to do a intrabiliary uh, bleeding. Or do you want to go abroad and have it done? If you have the finances, do you want to go abroad and have it done? The choice is yours. So once they have these things, they appreciate. And they go around and say, that doctor gives you all the details of what can be done for you, what are your options. So patients come to you with the recommendation of the patient. Um, I don't think anybody would have traveled extensively like you. You have gone to the nook and corner of the world and you have visited all the continents. And uh, you have been to various parts of the South American continent, various parts of the African continent. After being to all these places, how proud you are to be an Indian, particularly most of the conferences, probably 40 years before we had been to the South American or the African countries, you would have been the only Indian there. And how proud are you to say that you are an Indian and you have done so much? Yes, I had work that I had done, which was worthy of presentation in international conferences. Hence, at that time, nobody expected anybody from India to come and present a work in an international conference. That too, traveling half the world around. So when you go there, you they appreciated your participation. They listened to you and they accepted that the facts that you're told are true and it is not concocted. Because some add zeros after their numbers and present it, whereas they will, which is easily detectable. Uh, at this juncture, I would like to ask whether you have achieved all your childhood dreams or still there are some. First of all, I had no time to dream <laughs> because I was, as you yourself said, we start work at about six o'clock in the morning and go up to 11 or 10.30, 11 in the night. So now, Apart from this, I want to talk on the lighter moments you have shared okay. in your entire journey. And now, on this table, I have got a few photographs upside down. Sir, I want you to pick up a few photographs and tell about those photographs. Before going to that, I have been seeing this table for almost 30 years now. And this, I think this table should be very precious to you. A small note about this table, sir. Uh, this table was my father's. He, I think he bought it in 1936 when he started his practice. He's older than me and we have preserved it uh, without any damage to the country. Today there's nobody who can repair it if it goes out of order. Yes. This photo. Uh, this was the first ELSA meeting. Okay, this is the first ELSA meeting in 
uh, uh, sorry, this is the first FIAGS meeting which we held in Bombay. You will see here Tempton Udwadia the, and Dr. Uh, Agarwal, who was a secretary at the time. Tempton was the president, and we were there at the Taj Palace in Bombay. That was our first international uh, annual meeting of the IAGS. And uh, this was the first ELSA meeting in Singapore. And uh, this was the Indian delegation at Singapore. Uh, I can see all of them, they are still present and some of them are not with us presently. But we made a big presentation at Singapore on the ELSA inauguration. This is a black and white photograph of me talking at the annual convocation of the Madras Medical College. Which year was this? 1960 December. 1960 December. I passed my MBBS. I got about uh, over a dozen gold medals in various subjects. I was given the prestigious Johnson gold medal for the best art going student and thereby the honor of replying on behalf of the students of that batch to the surgeons and the teachers uh, for making us. Was any office. subject you left behind or you got all the subjects? I didn't attempt the gynecology. Why was it, sir? Not interested. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the meeting where after the meeting we had a tennis tournament in Tokyo uh, arranged by Yamakawa after a laparoscopic workshop. And again, as you had mentioned, in, this was the first laparoscopic cholecystectomy workshop, which I conducted in Willington Hospital in January 1992. And Yamakawa and his uh, assistant, Kano, were there to demonstrate their methodology. You see here, this was the convocation ceremony of the FIAGS in Ahmedabad. You see our present president, uh, incoming president, and Suresh Deshpande. We had more than a thousand delegates who came and attended the convocation ceremony and received their certificates. And finally, this would be the pinnacle of what I said of my being honored with honorary FRCS of the Royal College of Thailand. These are few of the photographs that I was able to fish out from a large collection. Would you like to mention or give some credits to somebody who taught you or who has been your colleague? If so, who would you mention? First and foremost, as I've already mentioned, Dr. G. R. Parabara. He was a professor of surgery when I was in the Madras Medical College. I was his final year student, rotating in turn in the surgery, one year resident, then postgraduate study with him. Next person who left an indelible image impression on me is late Professor Sarachandra. He was a walking encyclopedia. <coughs> he would give an answer to all our questions. He was the only professor who would tell Krishna, I'll read it up and come and tell you. I can't give an explanation out to you. No other professor would have said that they were not aware of the answer to the question that we put to him. Thank you again. On behalf of the IAGS, thank you. Once again. I'd like to thank the IAGS for having selected me as a person worthy to be considered as a legend. And of course, you, my favorite student, thank you, sir. interviewing me today. Thank you. Thank you sir.
Nitin, we can answer. Uh, welcome, Ishwar, sir. Uh, thank you for joining us. In fact, uh, I should thank uh, IIGS for giving me this uh, important uh, responsibility. And I thank uh, my teacher where I learned endoscopy in the same room where Professor Krishnarao started doing endoscopy 40 years before. Thank you, Krishnarao, sir, for uh, sharing your pearls of wisdom. And uh, in fact, it's quite inspiring. And we understood the importance of traveling around to learn important procedures. And the teacher is proud when the student excels better than the teacher. Thank you, Govindraj, sir. In spite of uh, this uh, situation, for traveling all the way from Trichy to Chennai, and I was told uh, Dr. Govindraj was the first guest to Dr. Uh, Krishna Rao's house after almost six and a half months. Not even a servant or not even a person have visited Dr. Krishna Rao for the last six and a half months. So I thank uh, the family of Dr. Krishna Rao to have accommodated to the request of the IEGS and hosted Dr. Uh, Govindraj sir in this specific regard. Thank you, Govindraj, sir, for making the program very lively and uh, getting the best of the wisdom. And in fact, it is a unique opportunity to go through the early rem memories of IAGS with nice photographs. Thank you, Govindraj, sir. Now I hand over to Dr. Ishwar Murthy, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Ganeva. Dear President, my dear senior colleagues, friends and ladies and gentlemen, thank you for all of you for joining our IAGS Prime Time as a second time here. Uh, well done, Dr. Kanagavel, Dr. Goindraj, for taking all the enormous efforts to bring two great personalities to the focus in the minimal access surgery. We have the doyen of endoscopic surgery, Dr. PKR, today. Thanks to Dr. Goindraj for interviewing him, and uh, nice to hear so many nostalgic moments from him. I think with these blessings, we are now doing the online EFAGS. People interested, please join. And of course, we had the first 45 minutes, a fabulous presentation on fund application by our uh, Professor Ajay Kriplani, a doyen of laparoscopic surgery. Thank you, sir. I'm sure I can recollect those days where you brought the FAGS, the Essential Laparoscopic Surgery Fellowship uh, is one of you. I think you are one of the brain, it is one of your brainchild. We are proud to say that we have now, thanks to Raman Goyal, all of our EC members, we are now the online FAGS batch 2 is actually starting today, the very moment. In addition to these two online courses, uh, people interested in the online course, the advanced laparoscopy course, especially the colorectal, the vacancies are there. Still, we have about 10 vacancies to take because this is the only course to be taken this year in colorectal FAGS and open till the 20th of September. Please join. I'm sure you will well versed with this and I'm sure by February 2021, you'll be getting the convocation invitation and get the certification. And I should say thank again the Nitin Kumar and also Kritika, the team, our digital partner, the Talk Pluses for this another edition of Seamless Transmission. It was wonderful to have you both uh, waiting and also coordinating the event so nicely. So. I think we are having, as Kanagavil is keeping us very busy with the next fortnight, I am sure on, uh, the next one is going to be even better than today. It's going to be Professor Kusheri versus uh, Professor Utwadi, sir. I'm sure I have to wait 15 days. That's what I'm uh, saying. Otherwise, I, I'm just waiting to see that momentous occasion again. And uh, until that time, uh, my dear members, all my dear doctors, please stay safe and uh, goodbye. Good night. Long live IAGS. Let us do everything together. We can do it together. Thank you. Thank you, Ishwar, sir. Thank you, team IAGS. Thank you, Doc Lexus team, for uh, allowing us to have a flawless platform. It's been a pleasure hosting all of you. On behalf of the IAGS, President, Secretary, and the entire team of uh, Executive Committee member, we wish you a warm good night and look forward to have you in more academic activities of IAGS. Thank you. Good night, one and all.